Okay, welcome back to Tim's Garage. Um, now that we've got the turbo physically and mechanically bolted up to the uh, engine, and I've actually gone through and connected up the cooling lines and gotten everything buttoned up regarding the turbo, I want to now take a little time and explain um, the attachment of the oil and cooling lines and then the process that I went through to uh, fill the cooling system and try to extract as much of the air as possible so that I could actually take the vehicle out and drive it. Okay, now that the turbo is fully installed, you can see that I've got the heat shield installed. I have the, uh, the uh, upper and lower O2 sensors installed back into the catalytic converter. I've got the, uh, the two lower coolant lines, these two lines, uh, this one located here and this one located here. And I also have the oil line on the top, all done, secured, and torqued to the appropriate torques. And I'll include a, uh, a quick page from the GM guide as an image for the torque specs. In addition to that, um, I replaced all of the gaskets, and there's two different gaskets that were quite hard to find for those. So this is what the gaskets look like for those uh, fittings. And this coolant gasket, the part number for this coolant gasket is right here, and it is uh, 126 and I also replaced the oil line gasket, which is a little different. It has uh, two different sized holes. The coolant gaskets are the same size hole top and bottom, and the oil gasket is a little different size. And the oil gasket is part number 126-11119. And both of those were still available through GM, although it was very difficult to find the actual part numbers in the online and in the books. In addition to going through and doing this, I've added some additional heat shielding. And I, you can see right here on this lower heater pipe, I've added some heat shielding that's uh, Express Sleeve from Thermotech. And I've ordered another larger size of Express Sleeve that's gonna cover from here all the way down, covering over this particular clamp, just to create a little additional heat barrier for the heater tube that's located right there. But I've got everything back in. I've uh, reinstalled and torqued the heat shield in place. I've got the charge tube uh, in and installed, which was quite a challenge to get it in. And it's important that when you get both of the charge tubes in, you need to close the hood and double check the clearances from the upper portion of the charge tube, this area right here on both sides, and this area right here on this charge tube to make sure that they clear the hood. Uh, originally, I had this one in and it was rotated a little bit too much outboard and I had to undo the clamps and rotate it inboard and, and do it all up. Um, I did reuse the two factory RG Ray clamps that were installed on the car that have the spring-loaded tension, but I also upgraded all of the clamps to those throughout the uh, vehicle buying some online. They're not inexpensive clamps but I doubt very much I'm gonna have any issues with these coming loose when the uh, car is cold and the aluminum chooses to shrink a bunch. So that's with the, uh, all the fittings done. I've got the, uh, the actual uh, intake tube installed and everything is all done and tight and ready for me to uh, uh, top up the coolant and get the vehicle fired up and see whether or not all my effort has paid off. Okay, so after I've uh, tried to bleed the cooling system, I did try lifting the reservoir and uh, raising it up to 14 inches as I've uh, been instructed to, both from online videos like from DDM Works as well as others. What I decided to do instead is because I have a vacuum pump, I've connected a vacuum pump to the top. I've sealed off the port that is the uh, port that runs to the top of the radiator. I've sealed that off so I can create a vacuum in the pump and I've started to create a vacuum in the system 
so that I can suck the coolant down. And you can see I had that up at the seam a few minutes ago and it has now uh, created a vacuum and it's sucking coolant out of the reservoir. Now, this is a, a wonderful option for those people that don't have some of the expensive tools as a way of being able to create a vacuum and bleed the system because I've, I've taken out probably about a quart more fluid than what I was able to fill in just mechanically. So I also have an airlift device that I'll use when I'm done, but this may be an option for those people that don't have that. I'm gonna add some coolant and I'll come back and uh, do a little bit more suction. Okay, so here I'm back at it again. I've got the, the vacuum gauge out here and I'm you know, creating a little bit of vacuum and I haven't seen any coolant come out of the upper portion of that yet. But you can watch the, the coolant level being drawn down each time I do a little pump of fluid. You can see it being drawn into the system, being pulled out that uh, upper bleed in the top of the block, or in the cylinder head, pardon me. And it seems to be pulling out quite a bit of air and pulling the uh, coolant into the system and I still have not pulled a drop out of the system itself. Now this system that I'm using is what I typically use for brake bleeding, but uh, it seems to be working pretty darn good for this. So I'm gonna, oh, there we go. I finally got a little bit of coolant out just in time. So I've now bled all the, all the, uh, uh, air out of the system all the way to the top of the uh, the bleed and I will uh, cap everything off and uh, top off the fluids and get ready to fire up the car. Okay now that I've managed to use the uh, brake bleeding device which is what I used I pulled just the tiniest amount of coolant out of the system and I pulled that coolant out in the upper port and the cylinder head that's uh, located right here. I simply put the vacuum line on here and kept drawing coolant out and I wound up drawing out about, um, I'd say about two and a half quarts of coolant um, down into the system from the reservoir which is located uh, right here. I kept topping, I kept topping this up because when I use the uh, raise the reservoir approach it still wouldn't draw enough coolant out so I managed to draw coolant out got it all topped up I'm I have no illusions I'm still gonna have to use an airlift and pull the last little bit of air out of the system but for those people that don't have an airlift and that the raising the reservoir up doesn't quite work most people you know for very inexpensively can get a brake bleeding tool and use that this is a craftsman one it's very inexpensive I think it was like $30 and it uh, it works fairly well. Okay, so now that we've got it all buttoned up, let's see if it starts. Hopefully, it'll be a, uh, a first time try. Let the fuel pressure build up. And we have success. Okay, fired it up. Now, uh, next thing is I need to top up the transmission fluid level because I changed out the radiator. It's an automatic transmission, so I'm going to have to take it and take it into a place that set the car level. And while the car is running, top up the automatic transmission fluid with Dextron 6. Uh, I will need to make sure I bleed the cooling system with the uh, airlift device once I get the car all hot. Check everything for leaks, make sure I've got no leaks coming from the vehicle. And then I get to start doing the uh, remapping of the computer to match the big wheel turbo and the other upgrades that I've done. Okay, now that we've got the initial fill on the cooling system complete, now I need to fire the car up and let it get warm and open up the uh, thermostat and allow the coolant to circulate properly. And to, to make sure that I get the final little bit of air out of the system, I've got a process that I'm gonna use a device called an airlift device. And this airlift device has an expanding rubber uh, plunger that seals to the inside of the coolant tank. I've already initially got this thing installed and I've, I've got a five inches of vacuum already drawn on the, uh, on the tank showing that it's got a good seal, there's no leaks in the system 
and it's ready to go. Now I need to apply uh, compressed air to the valve right here and it's going to run across this opening and creating an, uh, a negative vacuum pressure inside the reservoir. I will then open this valve and increase the pressure or the negative pressure to about 24 inches and let the car run and warm up and it'll suck the last of the air out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in two stages. I've created a vacuum and originally this particular location I used my uh, brake bleeding tool to be able to draw the last little bit of air out of here. Once I drew all the air out of there, now what I'm going to do is I've got a clamp on the line right here to seal it and I'm not going to pull any more vacuum on this. Instead I'm going to leave this line open from the top of the the side tank on the radiator and allow it to pull a vacuum and pull any last air that might be trapped in the top portion of the radiator assembly. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to fire up the car and let it start to warm and draw a vacuum and uh, carry on the process. Okay. All right, I'm going to apply the hose to create the vacuum. Okay, I'm going to draw the vacuum. I'm going to come and open the valve and I'm going to draw the vacuum. You can see the gauge is moving up. Oh, I already drew a little bit of air out of the system. You can see it managed to pull. So I've pulled air out of the system already out of this tank. So I've got that drawn pretty well. Seal that at 15 inches. That's all I need to do. I'm going to take this clamp off now and see if that does anything. Yep. And now we've got the both of the lines fully open and hopefully completely wet. You can see the tank, the level in the coolant reservoir is raised as I've got 15 inches of vacuum on this. I'm going to let that run. I think it's pretty good. I can see a little bit of air coming through here. You can see just the tiniest little bit of air slowly trickling into there. Oh, that's the pressure keeping up. Just do a little bit more vacuum. Okay. Okay, it looks like uh, it's doing pretty good. Okay. And I think there we have it. I think I've got all the air out of the system. I'm going to go ahead and shut everything off, button everything up, and we'll drive it for a couple of hours, and then I'll come back and redo the process after I get the transmission fluid topped up. Okay, we've now got the cooling system purged completely, or as complete as we can. My understanding is we have to do a couple of drive cycles in order to pull all of the uh, final amounts of air out of it. I may need to use the airlift device yet one more time to be able to make it so that it uh, will be completely airless in the cooling system. And the way you do that is you run the vehicle and cycle it and allow the vehicle to cool overnight and recheck the level in the reservoir. And if the level has dropped down below the seam in the reservoir, you'll want to top it up in the morning when it's nice and cool. Never open the cooling system hot or even warm because that contraction of air when you open it up may allow it to draw in more air back into the uh, upper portions of the engine where you wanted to get it out from in the beginning. Okay, so I did also mention that I was going to take the vehicle and get the transmission topped up. Um, instead, I decided to jack it up on four jack stands. warm the car up and uh, run it through the gears and dr take the drain plug out myself and I'll, I'll show an image of that drain plug uh, in the video here. And that uh, uh, drain plug was fairly easy to remove uh, with the car running. I found that I only had to add about a half a pint of transmission fluid after changing out the radiator so it all worked out well. So now I've got the car with the cooling system completely full 
and uh, as much of the air uh, bled out of the system as I can. I've got the transmission topped up to uh, reflect the correct level based on having the vehicle level and the transmission. I think it's between uh, 80 degrees and 135 degrees. So now with the car roadworthy and the ability to drive the car, some of you may be wondering why this fender is still off the car. Well, uh, day one of ownership, I found out exactly how fragile these cars are on a speed bump in Las Vegas at the hotel. And to give you an understanding, I'm not going to be reinstalling this fender until I repair all the damage to the bottom of the fender. And I, and I want to repair that fender because I want to be able to blend the silver. And if you look, you can't even see the damage on the fender when it's upright. So I happen to work for a, a large coatings manufacturer called Axon Abel. And I'm going to uh, enlist the help of one of my technical trainers to respray this fender after I've repaired all of this. And there will be a future video on uh, repairing this that I'll, uh, I'll create to show the process that I go through to repair this in case others decide they want to repair their fender as these things start to become uh, less and less available to be able to be uh, replaced. So I do have a replacement fender. I just don't want to use it at this point. I want to repair this one. So that said, um, the next step is uh, for us to go through and start with the tune from RPM Motorsports. It's going to be a stage three tune with the big wheel turbo, the uh, three bar sensors, the large charge tubes, and the larger intercooler. And that, that three bar tune, I'm very excited to see how, uh, how the car drives after I've got all of the tuning finalized. So I look forward to seeing you in that future episode. Thanks for watching. Please like and share and uh, subscribe if you haven't already.